Começamos mais um Podbi e se você não me conhece, meu nome é João Augusto, eu sou o apresentador desse podcast e essas camisetas que vocês estão nos vendo aqui é da nossa loja virtual, já daí vai lá nos www.podbi.com e vocês também têm outros produtos lá e já vamos lá conectar. Tá chegando Natal, já falei para vocês várias vezes nos episódios, não deixa de encomendar a sua última sobremesa que tá chegando agora da Brigadeiro, tá bom? Então entra no site lá da Brigadeiro, vou deixar aqui o QR Code e aplicando o PodB10 você tem 10% de desconto. E as encomendas é até o dia 15 de dezembro, então não dá para perder. Gente, hoje o podcast vai ser em inglês, tá? É um podcast especial. O meu convidado, ele deve estar tá surtando, que ele tá me olhando assim, meu Deus, ele tá falando em português. Don't freak out, I just introduce people in Portuguese. <risos> Don't worry. Ok, so, e o podcast vai ser em inglês, mas o YouTube está oferecendo a todos traduções. Então você vai lá nas configurações, muda o idioma, e aí você coloca a, a, a legenda em português, tá bom? Espero que vocês gostem. O podcast de hoje vai ser sobre o tema de HIV e AIDS, para os nossos tratamentos, curas, como é que faz todo... Esse, esse lidar com isso, né, nos dias atuais, porque se você, vocês não sabem, o dia 1 de dezembro foi o dia mundial contra a AIDS. E é muito importante a gente sempre estar tá falando sobre causas é, importantes, mundiais, e principalmente aqui no PodB a gente vai falar sobre isso, tá bom? Welcome everybody, my name is João Augusto, if you don't know me, I am the presenter of podcast. Sorry I'm to talk in Portuguese before, because my main audience is from my country, Brazil. So today we're going to celebrate, not celebrate, but we're going to talk about HIV, uh, the treatments, how to deal with, how it is nowadays. And the special part of it is because I, be, I bring uh, a nurse, which I know, and he's a very nice guy, and he up to uh, up from this idea of course i can go there and we can talk about this um before i introduce my 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 guest so you see here in the QR code about the desserts for christmas which are coming up so are you a big fan for savory or or sweet massive sweet taste. sweet yeah me yeah. too so of course when you coming this uh, the christmas is the first thing i look is the des if the dessert is good i don't care about savory honestly okay. i just want the shit So I like it really well dessert. So Brigadeiro, I don't know if you know, Brigadeiro is a place here and she does pastry, not pastry, but she does all the kinds of cake, Brigadeiro, which is a famous dessert in Brazil. And pavé, it's famous in Brazil as well. And lemon tart. So I leave the QR code here on the screen. If you apply the coupon for PodB10, you have 10% on discount, which is amazing. Anyway, so my guest is from Perth, WA, exactly, from Australia. So he's been studying nurse for more than 16 years. And nowadays, he's working in HIV department. Is it correct? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Welcome for Matthew Jones. <laughs> There's 300 claps. And those the claps. Well done. So welcome. Thanks very much for coming for this special day for us. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Yes, so before we start, so let's introduce a little bit about yourself. So you started nurse for 16 years old, so you've been studying nurse for 16 years old. Yeah, yeah, I started studying uh, back in 2006. Wow, um, that's a lot. Yeah, so I went into the workforce in 2010 mm -hmm. and been working ever since. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. So why did you start nurse? Um, uh, I was uh, I was a little bit unwell as a, as, a, as a kid, so I was exposed to a lot of healthcare and a lot mm -hmm. of nurses and doctors. And um, I, I, my mum tells me that when I was young, I used to walk around with a stethoscope and try to listen to people's hearts and all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, I then got into 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 music and and followed that for for quite some time. Yeah. And, um, Uh, sort of exited school with the idea of going into the music industry in, in, in some in some capacity, um, uh, and then sort of did a did another sort of 180, and then got very interested in in, in nursing. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, after a couple of people around me got sick, and thought that that's what I wanted to do with my life, and I never looked back. Yeah, yeah. sounds great. Yeah. So, and uh, did you graduate here in WA or in another place? Yeah, no, I did all my schooling, all my nursing schooling here in WA. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. And what's the pros and cons uh, to the nursing? 
to be a nurse? Yeah. Um, I I sort of equate uh, I I did a bit of retail work and I sort of equate it to um, uh, like working in retail. So I mean, of course, you have to have the knowledge of of science and how the body works and uh, medications and stuff like that but it's sort of the um, the delivery and the and building um, the rapport and relationships with your patients which yeah. is which is very much a customer service type of type of thing um, so it was it was very transferable um, to go from retail into nursing um, and to incorporate those skills um, great things about nursing is can do whatever you want. Like I, I started working out in um, uh, in heart nursing um, mm -hmm. and in ICU and emergency departments. That's um, really tough because everybody's really cr like uh, feeling pain, like uh, level five pain every time. Yeah. I know I'm a carer, so I know it's like when you're asking people like uh, look after elderly most of the time. When you look after saying how pain, how is the pain? You know, it's getting one to five. It's saying ten. Yeah. How can I do it now? <laughs> you know, yeah. because you don't know. That's I mean, the emergency time is crazy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a, and um, a job just randomly came up at the at the West Australian AIDS Council. It's now now it's called WAC. Um, and I wasn't terribly interested in sexual health and HIV. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm very mechanically minded, and I love how the heart works. And I was sort of dead set on that. Um, but I wanted to step away from from hospital work for a while, so I took the job, not not being that keen to go into a career in sexual health and HIV, but um, being being a a gay man and mm -hmm. and working for an uh, an LGBTI focused community organisation, um, uh, I literally fell in love with to the, work with the, the the people that we were seeing mm -hmm. um, and found that um, the job. Uh, that it was uh, was far more rewarding than um, retail than, selling a pen and almost like giving people pain relief or jumping on their chest and shocking them back to life and stuff like that. Um, sexual health and HIV incorporates so much more than just the the medical. There's so like the social, the psychological is all incorporated in that, and I find it really rewarding to to be able to help in that. That's amazing. And how long have you been working in HIV department? Um, so I've been working at the, at the HIV service at a major hospital here for uh, eight months, so about March this year. Um, and I've worked the last 10 years previously in, in sexual health and a little bit in HIV. It's a big taboo to work in HIV department. So when you say to, you work in there, do you feel like people look into you like, oh, do you? like? So sometimes, yeah, yeah. It was it, it was interesting when I when I told my parents that I was having a bit of a change in, in, in specialty, if, if mm -hmm. you were going from going from um, a cardiac uh, unit into into sexual health and H and then into HIV, um, uh, and and I did find that there was a little bit of a stigma in terms of who I was likely to meet in in my work and and um, the quote unquote types. Of patients um, that I would see um, which, which which was proven proven mm -hmm. untrue um, uh, and uh, and it was coming from from obviously my, uh, mainly my father who was who was of a different gen generation and and had a little bit of um, a religion uh, background as well um, so it was a little bit um, different for them to understand but they've seen fruits of a lot of my work and and they're very of me. Yeah, no, it's uh, uh, absolutely. So it's because you're doing something for the community, everybody. You're dealing with um, situations that we cannot measure, like uh, how is traumatic, how can be really crazy when you figure out the symptoms. Because like the media and we who become like if we're born in the 80s, it's kind of we grow in 2000, understand how was, but who was. I think like I'm born in like 60s or 70s, they started this, the HIV situation everywhere. And, and like a, when you say about HIV, but you're not saying HIV, so people used to, used to say like AIDS. So you have AIDS, not HIV. So it's, it's a big paradigm in between these two, which yeah. is a HIV, first symptoms you can treat, yeah. AIDS you can treat, but it's 
dangerous. You can be like a, like I say, it's the high, uh, like uh, the higher symptoms, the higher situation, you can cause do- death in that situation. Uh, nowadays, we, we know like uh, 37 million people living with HIV nowadays. Uh, it's not incurable, but it's treatable, and people can live forever with HIV. They're not dying with HIV, they die for something else. They can die mm. for, I don't know, a cancer, and or can have a heart attack or something like that. How do you feel nowadays? It's when, because we're dealing with the first symptoms of people when they come to the test, and I think it everything like that. How do you feel like a, when people come approach you, they say, hey, HIV is the first like a appointment. How the whole, how do I do? It's um, it's kind of uh, every time it's terrifying, even nowadays because you have uh, so many information in the media. You Google like two seconds. If you say I'm gonna die from HIV, the first thing they know. So like it, less than two seconds. So do you feel like people more um, they don't have enough information than before? Um, I think people have more information than mm-hmm. before, um, uh, and it's interesting how you mentioned the the generation gap in terms of information. So, um, I mean, it's 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 a it's a perfect analogy that someone who was born in the in the fifties or sixties, um, their attitudes towards HIV diagnoses and treatments would be much more different than people um, uh, of our generation where we're, we're having babies. Um, so we sort of we've sort of straddled in our lifetime, um, like as as kids we, we would have we would have remembered um, HIV not being a fantastic prog- diagnosis and mm-hmm. prognosis, um, and people would still get quite quite unwell. Um, but now, um, by the time we've sort of gone into our working lives, the the, the treatments for HIV are, are now um, fantastic. Um, Saying that, when people still first get diagnosed, it is still quite a shock, and there is still an element of um, historical like, trauma. Yes, yeah, like I, a I frustration guess. in terms like I didn't look after myself better, what I have done. Yeah, yeah, it's it it, it, it would definitely be a combination of sort of what um, uh, gay men had. had unfortunately had gone through in the 70s and 80s in the very early days um, when nothing was known about HIV um, these days we have PrEP um, and that brings in a different dynamic when mm-hmm. people get diagnosed with HIV and they have that instant regret um, of oh, I should have done something sooner to prevent contracting HIV or it's a lot of coulda, woulda, shouldas Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, and especially around prep, um, that they often that um, a lot of people often underestimate the risk. Yep. Uh, sometimes, um, given Australia is a relatively um, uh, low risk country for, for mm-hmm. HIV transmission, um, but it does happen. So people sometimes, if they're not on prep and they contract HIV, it is really bad luck. Um, uh, but there is certainly situation, those exact situations that there is that instant regret that they could have, that they're in a country mm-hmm. that's, that's fortunate to be able to, to provide preventative treatment for HIV at a very low cost. Um, uh, yet HIV diagnosis still happens in that population. Mm. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, yeah, it's, it's kind of uh, everybody has to look after. And the best situation is using condom. And if you take PrEP and condom, perfect. You know, 100, 300% sure you don't have a HIV. But in t- before the HIV, we I, I followed some some people in my country, in, in Brazil. They had the HIV beginnings of 2000. So it was like like 10 pills per day, a different size, and have to have taken some time to make it like a work. Nowadays, how is the treatment? Treatments are fantastic. Um, uh, most, well, a good ninety nine percent of people that I see now um, are on a one a day treatment. So it's one tablet, one a day. Um, no different time. Si- no different times. Like uh, you have to take in the morning or afternoon, night time. Um, no, with, with with some of the treatments, uh, probably in the early two thousand tens, it was mm-hmm. still it was still a little bit sort of. 
home specific, like whether they would, um, like it would, they would have to take it with food or they would have to take it at night because of some mild side effects. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so there would still be a little bit of shuffling around in terms of, of how the medication would work in their body and the reasons why they would have to take it at a certain time. Um, but um, basically the top four options for tablet therapy now, you can take them at any time of the day. Um, they don't necessarily have to be taken with food um, and there's very little interactions with any other um, medications, whether it's prescription or non-prescription. Wow. Yeah, I'd say it's nothing. Literally, like, uh, there is no side effects like nowadays as before. Because I, I heard, like, people saying... Sometimes they have some side effects in terms of, uh, uh, you know, it can make me feel sick or something like uh, I can, um, can happen like the, I have like um, uh, vomiting or I have diarrhea. So it's today is like a zero literally side effects. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you, I don't think you could ever say, we could ever say zero. Um, people do still... I, I think the most reported um, side effect is some is often weight gain, mm-hmm. um, uh, and uh, and anecdotally there's been some signals with with some tablets that have that, that have caused weight gain more with some people than others. It is still very in- individualistic. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, um, but from an from an effective point of view, they're all equally as effective. Um, so we're now at a point where we look at different ways of getting medication in and trying to reduce side effects, um, like whether it be weight gain or, or a little bit of nausea and stuff like that, which, which still sometimes come in with these newer tablets. Okay. It's the only way for the treatment, like as soon as you got diagnosed with HIV, it's just by pill or you have another one? Um, uh, well, well, a long time ago, there, were, there, was, there was multiple pills, multiple times a day. Um, and uh, there, there was some injectable um, therapy, um, and that was that was usually reserved for people who were, who were very unwell and had um, resistant strains of HIV that they couldn't take certain other tablets. Um, that's that's not often the case anymore. Mm-hmm. Those medications are still available, but they're yeah. very very. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, in terms of uh, the beginning of the HIV, in terms of uh, if you feel unwell, so uh, what's the first symptoms you people can feel in terms of this? Like, uh, um, I know, like many people just go to the doctor when you feel uh, like unwell. There's have uh, some consistently symptoms that, but diarrhea, headache, things like that. You can have like because you're stressed, or you can have it because you have food poison or something. So you don't go usually to the doctor and say, hey, can I have a like, full blood test because I need to know what's happening to me? Mm-hmm. And I feel, as a foreigner, I feel here in Australia, like it's very rare to GP to give you the, all these exams. If you go that I'm feeling well, it's rare they say, mm, probably let's wait for a little bit more, two weeks, three weeks, if you're not feeling, because you, know, you want to see this, you're going to feel like 100% because then the cost of life is expensive. You don't want to be if you're sick every time you lose your job. But what's the like uh, the main com- like m- first symptoms you can feel like oh you should look after. I can do like a uh, do some uh, blood test. It maybe can be something else mm-hmm. than just a uh, something that's on a daily basis. Yeah. So so in terms of HIV, unfortunately, it's it's exactly what you've said. So you can get diarrhea. You can get headache. You can get a flu-like illness. You can get a temperature. So we do call that a primary infection. Mm-hmm. So that can happen within four to six weeks after um, uh, someone's acquired HIV. Um, and the, exactly how you've put it, so these symptoms can be dismissed as a cold or a flu and people may not present um, to a GP or uh, a sexual health service or um, not even think that it might be HIV, um, especially in recent years when we've had COVID around. Um, that people have have delayed getting HIV tests because they think it might be COVID. Yes. Um, <laughs> every, all, of, all of the symptoms I've listed off could, you could, they could be COVID as well. Yes. Yeah. Now, this is very tricky nowadays. I was another day, I get COVID, and then I got the, um, 
gastro something because of the aged care. Everybody got there. How come? I don't know. Because the people just stay inside. How come they have this? So people outside and brought. So all the care is gone. So you feel like, wow, feel like unwell, like a, you don't have it like power for do any strength for do anything in the whole two days. You feel like useless. Yeah, it's really tricky. And so you to feel like you've been diagnosed with HIV. What's the first step, the procedure you have to do? So you go to the health, uh, the health clinic and you say, hey, something un unwell or how you do? Yeah, so look, look in, in my experience, most of, most people who, who test positive to HIV the very first time um, and I mean it's always it's always traditionally been a blood test that's been drawn from a vein in, in the arm usually um, we now have rapid tests like COVID but it's used with blood um, uh, but they a lot of people don't often present with symptoms yeah um, uh, I can only think of a handful of people in, mm -hmm. in my career that have that have come in uh, saying, look, I've been unwell, I know I've had risk um, for HIV, and it's usually sexual risk, um, and, uh, and, and they've been correct. So, um, so they've had the test and, and they've kind of expected a result. 95% of people, it's purely on a regular test or, um, or an opportunistic test, whether it might be at a GP, um, uh, or at a festival um, uh, like uh, Mardi Gras, mm -hmm. uh, where they often do tests out of a caravan, which is fantastic. <laughs> I love that idea. Um, but a, a lot of the time, it is purely just someone has just tested, um, and they unfortunately tested positive for HIV. Yeah. Um, well, it's hard, but guys, it's not the day. Like it's like. It, you can dealing with the normal life nowadays is fine, I, I, as I think. Okay, um, I think the main thing you can die is that the bird jeopardize of people think about you, and you want to have it accept self acceptance for people that you have to look after this. Let's talk about a little bit of ah. Before you said that, uh, how often you recommend to do the blood test and check? Um, I always uh, recommend people testing every three months if they're regularly sexually active. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a, a lot of data suggests uh, at least yearly, which, which I would agree with. Mm -hmm. In reality, though, I'm a firm believer like, that the, the normal HIV test is a very cheap test. Um, so, and, and especially with the rapid tests that are available now. So I'm a firm believer that you can't test um, we still do look at window periods, so there is a six to twelve week time period that HIV will take to show up in the blood. Mm -hmm. So we do take that into account when we're testing people. Um, uh, but like I said, if people have gone to Mardi Gras or if they've gone on a holiday and they've had a lot of sex, too much sauna. <laughs> yes, sauna. <laughs> yep, definitely. Uh, um, uh, yeah, that, that I don't think you can test too much. I, I, I do I do say um, the one caveat is that oh, that if people testing a lot, it can create a little bit of anxiety mm -hmm. um, that they just continually want to know and want proof mm. um, that they that they're remaining HIV negative, um, and that can stir up quite a bit of um, of anxiety, and that can be a little bit detrimental um, in, in terms of terms of that person and it usually comes with a little bit of um uh a little bit of mental health around mm -hmm. um the the potential of of having hiv stigma mm -hmm. um being re being on the receiving end of that um and how they would perceive their their, their life should they become hiv positive i see yeah do you recommend that as soon as you've been diagnosed as a hiv person um uh, hiv diagnosis you recommend goes to the psychologist, do the therapy, or look after this. I feel that it always should be offered. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in in my experience, uh, I think it does help. Um, whether it's official therapy or whether it's simple talk therapy with a nurse or a doctor or just in the consult room, 
Um, I think that is very, very valuable, especially um, early on. And I think the way a HIV diagnosis is handled by um, the healthcare practitioner is very, very important. Um, uh, it's, it's unfortunate in some situations that GPs will deliver a HIV diagnosis and then they would handball it to, mm -hmm. to the service that I work for um, and the patient isn't even certain that their HIV is positive. They haven't had a solid result and a discussion around it yet. Um, so it doesn't... It doesn't um, allow the patient to start in a good place in terms of um, their, their journey, if you will, mm -hmm. um, to adjust to living with HIV. Um, uh, and I mean, the adjustment is very, very minor. Um, it's usually going on to one pill a day. Yeah. Um, so, like, um, it, it's it's more of a case of uh, the wraparound care, the the making sure that their mental health is okay, making sure that their social health is okay, um, even more so than their actual medical health at mm -hmm. the time. Um, uh, a, lot of, a lot of HIV care these days is, is, is based around that wraparound care as opposed to delivering the medication itself. I see. Yeah. Mm. Let's talk about a little bit of PrEP. Uh, you know, like it, it's more common for us gay people use PrEP. So, and I never seen any straight people, they know about PrEP. And it's really ridiculous because your PrEP is for everybody. It's not for just for a gay. It's not about this. It's about for everybody who have more sexually active and, you know, for the prevention. So, but do you, do you reckon after PrEP people stop using condom forever? Like I say, not using condom. Um, uh. I mean, I mean to answer, to answer the question around PrEP, um, I'm very pro-PrEP. I'm very uh, sex positive in my mm -hmm. practice um, uh, in, in terms of, um, like, I believe anyone should have as little or as much sex as they want. Um, and it's completely non-judgmental. Uh, non yeah. Um, and being a gay man, I can certainly relate to... Um, being afraid of having sex without a condom or without being on PrEP. Mm -hmm. um, PrEP, uh, um, th th the data actually offers more protection than condoms. Um, though I do believe that condoms certainly have their place. So um, we're talking about HIV, but um, by taking HIV treatment or by taking PrEP, um, we're not reducing risk for gonorrhea, chlamydia, uh, syphilis, um, which monkey, monkey pox, isn't it? Monkey pox. Yes, yeah, we have yeah, an injection, yeah. but the people are freaking out when it comes up in the last two years. Yep. Yeah, people are saying, wow, monkey pox, monkey pox, why don't we have the injection? Because this is what's so contagious, just to touch, you yep. got the monkey pox. Yep. yep. And, and, and we've even witnessed the, a very similar type of stigma with that mm -hmm. in terms of uh, very much related to early HIV. Um, but taking HIV treatment and 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 and, uh, and taking prep to prevent HIV is not going to prevent um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, um, something else, uh, stuff like that. So so condoms certainly have their place. So I'm sort of of the opinion that okay, if you don't really know the person, maybe condoms might be worth it. Or if you're at a sauna or a sex party, condoms might be worth Please. it. Um, <laughs> uh, but but there is um, a bit of wording around. Um, prophylaxis for, for STIs as well oh. uh, that you can take an antibiotic um, to to prevent okay. um, specifically syphilis but there is crossover effect for gonorrhea and chlamydia as well yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, and the, what's the benefits and, um, and the advantage of PrEP? So uh, I mean uh, at the start it was it was all about um, getting the HIV numbers down from a public health point of view. Um, uh, it was still predominantly uh, gay and bisexual men that were, that were contracting HIV. Mm -hmm. And since PrEP was implemented, those, nu those numbers have almost flipped. So um, female um, women get contracting HIV was, was low and still remains that way. 
um, though heterosexual men acquiring HIV uh, is now is now higher than than homosexual men acquiring HIV, mm. and that's due to um, uh, gay men, and I think from a historical point of view, because because as a as a collective we were very um, self advocative in terms mm-hmm. of getting HIV treatment and. And even sourcing it themselves is a fa- fantastic movie with Matthew McConaughey called Dallas Buyers Club, which is a perfect analogy of what was going on at the time. Um, and prep was taken in the same way um, that people were self-selecting themselves for prep trials and implementation projects. Um, uh, prep is, ver- is is very beneficial in in also uh, reducing HIV anxiety. Mm-hmm. There's another element of protection, yeah. um, so it's not uncommon for someone to prescribe prep for someone who, on paper, may not be high risk for HIV, um, but is um, significantly terrified of contracting HIV by being on prep, and they may be using condoms 100 percent of the time. Yeah, but by being on prep, it alleviates their anxiety, and they're able to have a more fulfilling sex life. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, um, you know, how c- prep is uh, just some pill, you know, this, take, easy, easy, go, easy, go. I heard some of my friends, they take prep, they stop prep for a while. They say, oh, because I told to my doctor and the prep, because prep is in my system for a while, I can stop for a while because it's too effective. Is it true, this? It, um, to an extent, yeah. So, so, so... There's a couple of different ways of taking prep, and I and I do feel that it has um, become a bit of a grey area and confused a lot of people, including the health professionals. Um, uh, that you can take the the like I have I have no doubt it's the most researched way of of taking prep is taking it every day and not stopping. Yeah. Um, uh, people do take it on demand, um, and that's uh, on demand or event-based prep. So if someone knows they're going to have a, a sexual event, they can take two two tablets of prep um, between two and twelve hours before um, a sexual event, and then take one tablet of prep for the following two days. Um, or if they were to continue to have multiple episodes of sex. Further than that, they keep taking it daily until two days after they've stopped having sex. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's yeah. It's so and yeah, and that there's some plan. Yeah, <laughs> um, th- there's a there's a uh, protocol in England that says you can take it on the T's and S's of the yeah. week. So Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, Sunday, um, uh, which which is is known to be effective. Um, but I can't stress enough that daily prep is the best way to take it. Another uh, things about myths and truths about HIV is um, if someone is, is undetectable, which is the p- person is having the treatment, it's like the chance they pass the, the disease is like 0.000 because the person is it's undetectable is the person is negative, correct? Correct. Yeah. So it's the saying like, Person is like indetectable. They take like the treatments. They always go into the doctor, so they always be monitored. So without condom, if it's some, it has the chance that someone be passing the HIV for some for like a partner. Uh, is it real that it's almost one hundred percent sure that the person can be passing the HIV? One hundred percent sure in a scientific um, in a scientific context. Um, is 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 difficult to say. Mm-hmm. Um, in the real world, um, there is effectively no risk of contracting HIV if someone mm-hmm. is taking their medication properly um, and has an undetectable viral load. Yep. Um, so an undetectable viral load um, goes below what what the machine at the lab um, can find. Uh, so there's there's so little circulating virus um, mm-hmm. in the body that they're unable to cause transmission via via uh, sexual exposure. Yes, yeah. that's good. 
And is it true that it, many HIV medications in long term are bad for kidneys? Um, the, the, not some of the most recent ones. Um, a lot of uh, the early, the, the late 90 to early 2000 medications. Uh, we did need to make sure that um, people's kidneys were relatively good. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's it's virtually no longer the case. Mm -hmm. um, the, the medications, like I've mentioned before, they're refining the side effects and they're refining um, the, 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 the more longer-term effects on, on the body as well. So a lot of medications are either um, uh, metabolised, so they go through your body, through your liver or through your kidneys, uh, many HIV medications will go through your kidneys, um, but like I said, a lot of the like I said, the top four um, that that are used for HIV um, tablet treatment, the once a day tablets, um, uh, people can have quite significant um, kidney damage and still be able to take those tablets quite safely. I see. That's good. So. Um um, I heard it like uh, around three months of treatment. It's uh, almost one hundred percent sure that people will be undetectable. Is it real? Um, I, I've I've seen that I, I've seen that a lot in, in my practice. Um, uh, I think we usually say about six to twelve months. Mm -hmm. um, it depends on the individual. Um, it does depend on um, how long they've had HIV by the time they've tested positive. Um, and how high the viral load is, so how much virus is in their body at the time when we start treatment. Mm -hmm. um, but um, again, a lot of the newer drugs, like the, the, the top two really, um, are, are really effective at getting uh, the viral load down um, very quickly. And that would usually be in the three month part. That's great. Yeah. So the community, our community, um, it's, it has more transmission for HIV than straight people, or this this like uh, this stigma has changed nowadays. Um, I, I don't think it's stigma. Um, HIV transmission. The reason why um, in the early days it was really contained to gay and bisexual men mm -hmm. um, is because of the type of sex that we have. Yeah. Um, so w whether it's um, in, um, if you, if you, if whether it's insertive anal sex um, or more so receptive anal sex, um, uh, because the because of the anal tissue, um, and if someone's ejaculating inside an anus, um, and uh, and that um, that semen has HIV in it, um, then. The, the, that area of the of the anus. It's, it's sorry. <laughs> sorry, guys. My mom is trying to build a, a cube, and she's breaking the house. <laughs> we love IKEA. Um, oh my god! Yes. Um, uh, but yeah. So so because of, because of the the anatomy and the process of that part of the of the anus is designed to soak up fluid. Mm -hmm. um, as you can imagine, the, the virus is, is readily um, uh, introduced to the body. That, that, that's, the, that's the easiest way. Um, whether with heterosexual um, sex, um, traditional heterosexual sex, mm -hmm. so penis in to vagina sex, um, the risk is lower. The vagina has a lot more barriers. Um, and lubrification as well. Um, correct, correct. Everything. It's a lot more hardier, yeah, because it's, it's, it, it is it is designed to receive. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. Uh, but uh, it, it's a, it's a, it's actually a very good point um, that we do ask um, in sexual health, especially um, if uh, um, heterosexual females are having receptive anal sex, because then that that makes them higher risk for HIV as well. Yes, ah, well, well, it happens, guys, come on. Um, question, this can be a little bit more, um, how can I say, polemic question. If someone got HIV and it doesn't have like, a, like a, 
like, a, how can I say, in a daily basis partner, and they're like a pa- really partner. You have a lot just like a single person. Should that person should say they have HIV dispute for the new partners? Uh, um, I, I get this question a lot. Um, it, it's, it's very much up to the individual. Um, I always like to say once you've disclosed your HIV status to somebody, you can't take it back. Yeah. Um, so I'm cautious to tell people that they should, um, uh, but I certainly understand if a relationship is developing and it's six months, 12 months, and then a disclose, then, then a person is disclosing their status, that, that there can be sort of feelings of, of, of betrayal. But again, I feel that that does come from a place of misinformation um, in terms of risk for HIV. Um, in, a, in a general sense, um, I don't feel that it's anybody's business, um, anyone's HIV status, as long as they're taking um, precautions not to transmit the virus, mm-hmm. which is exactly what we've mentioned. So if someone's got a, an undetectable viral load, I feel, especially in any casual relationship, whether it's on Grinder, whether it's at uh, Steamworks, whether it's a, at a sauna, <laughs> um, that I, I really don't feel um, that... Uh, obligation to that, say. That people have to have the obligation to disclose. I think it, it should be like um, common sense. Right. You know, it just yeah. you feel comfortable, you say it. It's kind of a job application. You don't feel like, oh, I'm a... Top and bottom, I like this, I go to sauna. You don't do it, you don't yep. say it. Um, you just, like, I think it's case by case. Yep. Yeah. No, because I, I, I heard, like, when you when you say it, and people just block you and, like, okay, push you away, this is, can be really traumatic for someone who has this condition, and then they can feel like, oh, my gosh, so going to be this way every time I say but in some cases, some documentary documentaries I haven't seen, um, the people say, I prefer to say, and be 100% sure they said, this is me, you know me. Then before they say, no, no, it's not me, and the person you should say, blah, 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 blah. So that's the thing. I feel like a, um, it can be really tricky. Uh, so isn't there some jobs that HIV people should say this or no? Not necessarily. Um, mm. There is a fantastic um, resource um, called, uh, it's published by the HIV AIDS Legal Centre. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and there is more and more jobs being removed from uh, a, a list of um, occupations that people living with HIV aren't able to fulfil. Um, off the top of my head, um, I believe uh, um, uh, a person living with HIV and on treatment is unable to operate a commercial aircraft on their own. Mm. But as you can imagine, you've usually got two pilots on a commercial aircraft. Yeah. If you're flying from Perth to Sydney or Sydney to South America, you're usually having two to three pilots. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, there are ways around it. Um, and I believe off the top of my head, the only other two is um, military service. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, that may be getting removed. Yeah. And I think the primary reason is for field blood transfusions in a war setting. Ah. Um, uh, and the third one um, uh, is a medical position uh, if someone's doing what we call exposure prone procedures. So we're talking um, a surgeon or a surgical assistant or a surgical nurse where there might be sharp bone um, that they can injure themselves and bleed in, into a surgical cavity. Mm. Um, as far as I know, that's they're the only three. I um, see. That I think are still on on that list, if you will. Mm, interesting. I, I thought was no no any kind of job they can say. 
Interesting. Mm. It, it, it could have it could have changed. I haven't yep. looked at it lately, but um, for example, cooking. cooking as a chef, no problem. No problem. No problem. Cool. No. That's amazing. Uh, do you think like the most dangerous part of being diagnosed as a HIV person is the prejudice of people? Um. Yes. Um, I think a, a lot of uh, I, I, I think we've, we've mentioned I've certainly talked about it a lot before that um, a HIV diagnosis and whether we're initiating HIV treatment changing HIV treatment um, a lot of this wraparound care whether it's uh, whether it's psychology or um, uh, social issues or, or occupational issues um, uh, that's um, That's uh, sorry, my mind just gone blank. <laughs> that's fine. That's <laughs> um, fine. Like uh, people thinking that it's something like stupid, like uh, yeah. So um, it, yeah. So with the with the stigma around HIV and it is historical stigma. That's more conversation with patients that I have about the clinical or the medical side of of HIV that's management. That's sad. Sure. Isn't it? Nowadays, yeah, it is. there's a lot of yeah. information and just one click, yeah. you have so many informations. Um, I can imagine before, how was the like a beginning of ages that people, uh, when I study in you know, like the elementary school, we used to have like a table, how can you get, how can you not get? Like um, when I see that time, like people say, share forks, knives, napkins, drink water, that, that's so bad can you imagine that for that time in that age people people don't say no i'm not sharing table with him because he has hiv you imagine that yeah. well i mean and, and it's very unfortunate because uh, i i've had that exact scenario reported to me and this is about three years ago jesus in perth wow in Australia. That's horrible. um and and it was from a, a gp <gasps> Who had diagnosed um, a patient that I had read, had, um, I'd regularly seen when I was working in sexual health, and uh, they were told not to share cutlery, not to share towels, not to. It was just a bundle of misinformation, which was very disappointing for a doctor working in this day and age. Wow, well, well that's well, I can't even really imagine the situation for the doctor. Honestly, I can imagine someone for really elderly. Who has facing this situation before with someone they know they haven't you know I don't want to get to know this information anymore I don't want to update it but for a doctor it's ridiculous mm -hmm. anyway it's really rude uh, question this is a kind of um I have one friend I have sent to him this question but he has HIV and he's taking steroids like you get a muscular yeah yeah, so it's very common. Uh, he said, oh, because before I was super sick, so I couldn't stop. I said, but you're too sick. He said, no, so you can stop. Um, because they get addicted, you get a muscular. But do you think steroids um, uh, make the immune system worse for the HIV treatment or not? I don't believe so. Um, I, I haven't read into... In, into uh, uh, any research in that, um, mm -hmm. but we but we certainly have many um, patients on performing enhancing or not performing enhancing. I would say image enhancing um, uh, medications like anabolic steroids and testosterone and 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 stuff like that. It doesn't appear, from my experience, to change um, uh, any aspect of their immune system. Um, it doesn't change. Um, anything about their HIV. Uh, we don't need to change their treatment for HIV. Um, we take a very much a harm reduction approach. Um, it's, it's usually common, common knowledge that anabolic steroids aren't the best thing for you. Um, but if people choose to do so, um, then, then we would rather know about it and be able to support them um, medically and do a couple of different tests just to make sure that their body is tolerating what they're doing. Um, I see. 
uh, whether it's image enhancing or their bodybuilders and um, doing shows and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And do you think it like a drugs and alcohol can be prejudiced for for the HIV treatment? Certainly, certainly, certainly. Too much alcohol, too much drugs. What's the? Is it the same situation? Um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a couple of different situations. Um, uh, I mean, HIV can certainly be transmitted through in mm -hmm. injecting drug use. So we look at transmission around HIV and hepatitis C in that case. Um, there's certainly prejudice, um, even if a person has acquired HIV and has never used drugs, that, wow. there, may be in a, that there may be an assumption, whether it's um, a professional from a GP that they're, that they're going to see that's new someone that they might be dating, um, that there might be an assumption that, okay, this person has got HIV, so they must have done these things, um, which is a bit disappointing to see. And I'm a firm believer that not, no one asks for HIV. Um, if HIV only occurred to people who asked for it, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have had the epidemic that we've had. So <laughs> it's, 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 it's unfortunate situations, but um, certainly there is a, a little bit of typecasting in in certain people that use HIV for sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. So if someone like uh, have been diagnosed with HIV, doesn't treat, and like a, you know becomes AIDS, which is the worst scenario. So is it is it real that this person is really close to death when it comes to, to the AIDS or no? It's a, it's a long long life for people with AIDS. So it, it's uh, it, that's a very interesting question. So so AIDS um, is not how do I say? So HIV is the name of the virus. Mm -hmm. Age is the name of a syndrome. Mm -hmm. So to to differentiate between the two, AIDS uh, is a collection of criteria. So if someone has has AIDS, which, which that, that that term having AIDS is actually incorrect. Um, so AIDS means acquired immune deficiency syndrome. Yeah. So it's someone who has contracted HIV and their HIV has attacked their immune, t immune system to a point where they've, where they've started contracting more uncommon uh, bacterial and other viruses. Like flu can be like a, that is no immunology. Correct. Like the yeah. I was reading, it's like a CD4, which is like the white globals, the, the fighting for your. Yep. Kind of, they show the. I was watching a video. They show like a war. There's the CD4 yep. was like ah, that's war, and then yep. fighting on the virus and then killing them and then yeah, like that. Yeah. So 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 your CD4 cells, we we call them killer cells. Yes. So. So, so exactly like you're saying. So, so they go out. They go, okay. There's an infection here. Let's go out and get our rifles and 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 kill this infection. What HIV does is um, lowers those amount of cells. So you've got a big you've got a, a big amount of, of of a different virus when you have very little amount of killer cells mm -hmm. that can't fight that infection. So it's usually those types of infections and it's, and it's a specific type of pneumonia or a brain infection or a blood infection um, that would often be the reason that someone would pass away um, not and it's not directly from HIV, if that makes sense. Yes. Um, so people's immune systems are damaged so much from the virus that these opportunistic infections, which a person with a normal immune system often would have, but their immune system will take care of it. Mm. When people have virtually no immune system with advanced HIV, um, they fall into a category which is called AIDS. So AIDS isn't a separate virus or illness. Um, it is just uh, uh, at a point where a person's HIV has advanced so much that their immune system is damaged to a point where they're getting significant um, strange, if you will, um, illnesses. I see. Um, and usually 
Um, in most cases, uh, if we initiate HIV treatment, then that person will improve. Okay, um, so if their their immune system will restore with the help of HIV medication, mm -hmm. um, and their immune system hopefully will get to a point where it'll be functioning relatively normally, so they won't be having problems from these infections. And Amazing. And what you can expect for the HIV treatment in the future? It's, um, it's coming up something like a really interesting thing? Yeah, it's amazing. So, so, so in, in the time that I've worked in sexual health and HIV since 2000, goodness me, going back to 2012, mm -hmm. um, so we've gone from multiple tablets a day to single tablet day um, uh, therapies. And we've now, um, for the last few years, got injectable therapies. Yeah. So people have an injection um, on average every two months. That's amazing. Um, so it, it allows people not um, have to remember to take a tablet or for a lot of people, a, of the treatment. a HIV tablet means um, a daily reminder that, oh, yes, this has happened to me. Um, so it, it's it, it, the, the, the therapy is no better or worse than, than a tablet therapy, but what it means for some people not to have to take that tablet, whether it's convenience, it's like, great, don't have to remember to take a tablet with my coffee in the morning, um, or particularly for people I feel that have been diagnosed um, uh, a longer time ago, like the early 2000s or in the 1990s, what that, what that, what that pill or group of pills means for them not to take anymore. There's an element of freedom for a lot of patients with this, with this therapy, with this injectable therapy. Um, and moving forward, every time I go to a meeting, there always seems to be something new, uh, which is absolutely amazing. So we're looking at injections that are lasting longer than two months. So whether it's three months or six months, we're looking at um, uh, implants like women, women mm -hmm. have that can go into the arm that can last six to 12 months. Wow. So so it, it, it appears like we've got um, a great handle on the way we treat HIV and we're now targeting um, easier ways for HIV treatment to be given. Mm. So, I, I mean, I can just imagine um, someone living with HIV having an implant every 12 months and not having to worry about... That's, um, that's amazing. Uh, that's amazing. Taking, ...taking pills or even having, having an injection every two months because some people do find that inconvenient as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we're right at the precipice, at the precipice right at the edge of a, of a, of a big shift um, in in the way HIV treatment is delivered, um, and there's lots of pharmaceutical companies around the world that are working together, which is unusual um, for to to um, improve uh, types of HIV treatment um, for the people around the world. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. I think is that's the good thing of technology. When they improve the science, when they improve the, some treatments that have been really painful mm. um, for people that they can live in daily basis, that make their life easier yeah. than before, which is, wow, it's, yeah. it's really good to live in this era. And do you have uh, some message you can say for people um, living with HIV and they need to like a support or something yeah. at the moment? Um, I mean, I really feel um, that they're not alone. Yeah. Um, there are many allies for people living with HIV. Um, and like, like with anything, whether it's physical health, mental health, reach out and talk to somebody. Um, there are amazing resources around the world, um, particularly in, in, in Perth. Um, we have multiple services and non-government organisations and I'm sure 
um, that's reflected with many countries around around the world. Um, so I always say, don't suffer in silence. You're not the first person. You won't be the last person to be living with HIV. Um, although in the future, I, I certainly believe that there will be a last person living with HIV um, in terms of the cure. Um, but I think for people living with HIV at the moment, um, the, 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 there are battles, battles still being fought. Um, we're winning. Um, but like we've talked about, the stigma, the prejudice, um, as, as a gay community, as, 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 as an LGBTI community alone, let alone um, society as a whole, um, has improved over the years, but we do have a long way to go. Um, so I, I do feel that that's the, that's the main thing. But on an individual level, please reach out and speak to somebody. If you have a friend, um, there's uh, phone counselling. Um, I just can't stress enough to reach out and, and talk to somebody. Absolutely. Um, yeah, for sure. Yes, sounds amazing. Um, what I have to ask you, I have to ask you about any, something else. Do you think we're going to find a cure of HIV? Yes. Yes. Do yes. you think we are really close to that? Um, from what I've read, uh, I, I feel... In my head, I feel about 10 years. 10 years. So I, I do think it would be in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. Um... There, there's, there's been stories that many people know about the Berlin patient, about the London patient. Uh, yes. Th 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 they're extreme circumstances if you look, in, if you look yes. into, those, in, into those cases. Um, and we can't, we can't do that for everybody. They're very high-risk procedures. Um, uh, but um, I was reading uh, an article and the technology, especially around the recent development and quick de relatively quick development of COVID vaccines, um, that they are applying that biotechnology to um, trying to have what, what we would term a functional cure yeah. for HIV. So the thought of switching off the virus, not necessarily eradicating it, but switching it off so it's not affecting the body mm -hmm. and you won't have to, and no one would have to take tablets. That's amazing. Or Treatment. But this this patient has been cured. Yeah, yeah. I heard the articles. It can be cured. Um, is it? They have to all all the time to go to the doctor and see if is the cure is not effective or something like that, or it's one hundred percent cure. Um, I'm not, I, I don't think it's I don't think it's one hundred percent, and 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 I and I kind of feel for 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 the very few people who are in this position, it's it's almost like that they're guinea pigs. And and actually finding out why, um, because because the re the reason that that it's happened is that they've essentially reset the immune system through a bone marrow transplant, um, uh, which which is a, a a significant procedure in itself, um, uh, and and like I said, it's not it's not feasible it's not feasible for everybody. Um, but yes, those few people um, who who have had who have had this occurred. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're up to about four people now in in, in similar scenarios, um, uh, and, and thankfully they've they've all agreed to to somewhat participate in yes. in studies in terms of trying to work out how um, how this has happened. And are we able to manufacture a therapy that would that would switch off the HIV, um, which seems to have what's happened in these cases? Amazing. Well done, Matthew. Thank you so much for coming. I Very think it was amazing. Uh, the knowledge we can share this for worldwide. Everybody get to know this. Um, we need to talk about more for HIV, everything. I think you're more than welcome to come back when you have some new updates and the cure is coming. So I totally believe in that. 
um, because so much people suffering, it's not about the disease, it's about what the people think about myself or someone else. It's like, it's crazy about this and how many people suffering from the mental health because the diagnosis is not about the disease. So it's, sure. it's yeah. crazy. But thank you, thank you so much again to bring all this information to us. Thank you for watching us and please subscribe to the channel and soon you have a more uh, Portuguese special. Thank you. See you soon.